So thank you all for coming along to my talk. I know we got that post-lunch lull, but I'll try to keep you awake, at least, if not entertained, for the next 40 minutes or so. My name is Noel Welsh. I'm a consultant at Underscore. At Underscore, we do Scala development, training, mentoring, that sort of thing. But this talk is a bit about something else. Um, so my goals for the talk are really to show that, to talk about deep learning, I want to show that deep learning isn't so complicated, isn't so hard, at least not from a computational point of view. From the point of view of why it does what it does, I don't think anybody knows yet, but at least if you want to implement it, it isn't that difficult. Um, I found when I looked into deep learning, so something I was interested in, I wanted to learn more about, um, that it's very similar to functional programming. It really is all about function composition and um, some very familiar concepts. So hopefully you'll come away thinking that it's something you two can uh, understand. And it's something you could implement yourself in a few days if you wanted to. Not a production system necessarily, but certainly a toy system that you can have some fun with is very easy to get going with. So this talk is really it's a talk about the computational aspects of deep learning. It's a talk about sort of implementation aspects. I'm assuming that you don't know a huge amount about that, so we'll be going over some fairly basic stuff. And it's not really a talk about the uh, sort of practice of doing deep learning or using deep learning in production. Um, hopefully you saw the talk yesterday if you're interested in that aspect. So let's start off by saying, what is deep learning? Um, this is what deep learning is all about. Creating fun pictures. Um, not really. But these are some of the examples of things you can do with deep learning. So the picture on the left is um, an example of style transfer, where we've taken a picture of a um, statue and sort of made it look kind of stylized using a style of a actual a piece of marble. And the other two pictures are um, what are called deep dreams, which is basically making strange looking pictures out of normal pictures. So they're quite fun, but they're also practical aspects. It's used for image recognition, all those things in Facebook and so forth where it picks out who, who's in a photo, voice recognition, speech synthesis, lots of tasks that are coming prevalent. Most things that your mobile phone does probably has some kind of deep learning in there in some ways. Um, so that's the, uh, the use case of it, but what is it actually? Well, we can say that uh, deep learning is supervised learning, not necessarily supervised, but for our case, the supervised learning is premise functions by gradient descent. Okay, that's quite a few buzzwords packed into a sentence there. So let's spend the first section of this talk unpacking those buzzwords and seeing what I mean by supervised learning of parameterized functions by gradient descent. What are we talking about here? So three things I want to discuss. Parameterized functions, that's typo, supervised learning, and gradient descent. Let's get on with them. So parameterized functions. Let's start with a, a simple normal function, the sine function. You give it a value x and you get back the sine of x and you can graph that and you get something like this. Okay, very familiar to us, I hope. It's just a, it's a function. We like functions in functional programming. Now, one of the things you can do with this fu uh, the sine function is you can change its shape. So perhaps you could change the period and you can make this a parameter. So you give me a parameter and you get back a function. Give me the period, and I'll give you back a sign for that particular period that you've given me. So instead of just having one function, we now have a family of functions which are related by changing this parameter, the period. So we can make the period bigger, and we get the slower, slowly moving orange line, and we can make the period smaller, and we get the quickly moving um, blue line. Okay. So that's what parameterizing, uh, by I mean by parameterizing function, is basically just a function returning a function. It's a concept that we're all, I hope, familiar with. <coughs> so moving on to supervised learning, what's the idea here? So this is like the, the learning bit in machine learning, in um, you know, deep learning. And the idea is that we want to choose these parameters of our function to fit some data. Let's have an example of what we mean by fitting. Let's start some data. I'm sure you can guess what this looks like. So we might say, OK, I think this data is generated by a sine wave. Now let me try to choose a sine wave that's going to generate very similar data. So maybe and we're going to have our parameterized function again, and we're going to be changing the period to uh, create different sine waves. So if I start this one, very short period, not really a good fit. Make the period a little bit bigger, since it's getting better. Okay, that looks pretty good. 
And now we're getting a bit too big, and that's definitely too big. OK. So that's the idea of supervised learning, adjusting your parameters to fit some data that you have. In a typical classification task, the data could be like labels of saying, well, this is a picture of a person, this is a picture of a dog, or so on. But this will do as a simple example. And the final bit, then, is about gradient descent. So I described the idea of supervised learning, but to actually implement this in the computer, we need to make it a little bit more concrete, a little bit more formalized. So the idea here by gradient descent is it's one method by which a computer can algorithmically choose the parameters. So if, let's go back to our example here. The first thing we need to do is we need to uh, formalize, quantify how good is this particular choice of the parameters. And one of the ways we can do that is we can say, well, how far away from the function we've generated are all the points in the data. We get those distances, and we can add them all up. And that gives us a number. And the smaller that number, the less far away the points are from the, the function, the better the function is. The bigger it is, the worse the function is. And we can plot that. And we might end up with a plot like this. So we have here, <coughs> this is the very good part. I can reach it, which is great. I don't have a laser pointer. That, of course, is the function that actually generated the data. That's a really good fit. And you can see there are a few other cases which are fairly good. And they relate to uh, harmonics, um, as you might expect. What we can see from looking at this was if we started somewhere, intuitively, if we just chose a period, some kind of value, and we could roll downhill, then that would get us to somewhere better. So we might not end up at the best place. If we started over here, we might not end up at this best spot. But at least we would improve. And maybe we would choose some different random values of this period, and roll downhill, and eventually we'd find this best one. And speaking mathematically, what we want to do is we want to calculate the derivative of the, what's called the loss function, which is just that error that we showed earlier, with respect to the parameters, in this case, the period. And we can. Write that down formally. That's our loss function, squared error, or the distance. Uh, not the distance, have a square root. And uh, we take the derivative of it, and we get a function that looks like that. Doesn't really matter what the form is. And from this derivative, this derivative tells us the gradient. So uh, what the gradient basically means is the slope. The gradient tells us which way is downhill, so we can roll down there. Um, so if you've done calculus before, yeah, you'll know about gradients. If you haven't done calculus, all you need to know is basically the gradient is telling us about the slope. And then we can choose that as a direction to roll down. The final thing we need to do is to say exactly how we're going to roll down this gradient, down this slope. And all we're going to do is just make a little change to the parameters in this downward direction that we've calculated. So we might name it something that looks like this. Let's say we are. Uh, started at the white point up the top there, happened to be a lucky choice of parameters, ended up getting us to the, the, the minimum. And we move downhill a little bit, calculate the gradient again, move downhill a little bit more, and so on until we eventually end up at the bottom there, just by making these small adjustments. And that's an algorithm known as stochastic gradient descent. Um, there are lots of wrinkles you can put on this, momentum terms, and mini-batching, and all this kind of stuff that you can do. But this is just the essential thing, idea, just rolling downhill. Anyone can do that, especially when you have a few things to drink. So now we know what supervised learning of parameterized functions is. Um, let's move back to deep learning. So, so deep learning, supervised learning, parameterized functions by gradient descent. Now, one of the things that uh, we have to choose is which actual functions are we going to use. So I showed the example there of a sine wave. And it just so happened that the sine wave fit very nicely the data that we had. But when we're working on things like images or speech data like that, it's not so clear what the functions we should be using are. <coughs> so deep learning is. Two more things. It's a choice of functions that is very expressive, that can model lots of different situations. And it's the choice of functions that are suitable to GPU acceleration. 
So this kind of this software, deep learning software, frameworks like TensorFlow have been really important for the adoption because they've made it accessible and they've made it fast. So what is that choice then? Um, the choice in most deep learning is tensor operation, tensor multiplication, and a non-linearity. So two, two words there, two phrases, tensor, non-linearity, non let's unpack those. Um, tensor is a fancy word for a multi-dimensional array. So um, just like you impress your friends with monad in the pub, you go, oh, I was working with monads today, and they'll look at you with awe, I'm sure. You can now impress them with the word tensor, which just means basically a multi-dimensional array. So we have vectors and matrices, which you, you might know, um, one and two dimensional. If you, they have more dimensions, you call them tensors. So here is an example of a tensor operation, or a vector matrix uh, multiplication, of which uh, the tensor operation is the more general form. This would do as a simple example. It's easy to draw. And the idea is you get a vector of three dimensions. You multiply by a matrix, three by five matrix, you get out a vector of five dimensions. And uh, how this you do this particular operation, um, you probably learned in school. If you don't remember or you didn't learn, it doesn't really matter for the points of this talk. In this case, the, the important points are we do this multiplication somehow, and we have varying dimensions coming in and out of here. The other thing is that these matrices are all made up of numbers, um, two-dimensional array of numbers. And, and these weights, as they're sometimes called, numbers, are going to be the parameters that we adjust in our parameterized function. So we have the input, which could be whatever, our speech signal, our image, whatever it might be. The, the parameters are in that matrix there, and we get some kind of output. The other part of this is a nonlinearity. And uh, say so it doesn't, there are lots of different ones being used. All it has got to be something that's not a straight line, basically. If it's a straight line, then um, stuff won't work. But here's a simple example called the rectified linear unit that's used very commonly. And you see it's a very simple function. You give it a value x, and you either get 0 if x is less than 0. So you have a flat line. And then you just get a straight line. For x, you get x back. So the whole function is not a straight line. It's had two straight lines, so it's nonlinear. And then we might say, OK, an entire what's called a, a layer in deep learning might be this nonlinearity, this ReLU thing, ReLU, of x, the input, multiplied by the weight, matrix or tensor or whatever it is. <coughs> so that's one part of it. And then the other bit, the bit that makes deep learning deep, is basically just composing many of these functions. So like so. Da -da -da -da. Compile, compose them, whatever. So in deep learning, it's not uncommon to have like 30, 40, 60 layers, as they're called, or 60 functions, as we might call them. Um, but it's nothing particularly complicated from a computational point of view. It's just a whole bunch of multiplications chained together with these nonlinearities. OK. So at this point, any questions anybody has about this? No. OK, cool. Let's go on. So the way the deep learning is going is for what, what is being called differentiable programming. And let's talk a little bit about that now. So the idea is, firstly, you get software which is going to automatically compute the derivatives and compile this to your GPU code where it can run really quickly. And the other thing is that we're finding that the, what people are doing in deep learning is becoming more and more like what, what programmers do in programming. Um, so the model is getting more complex, and we're getting things like conditionals and loops. And this is where you get like the term differentiable programming. So doing deep learning is becoming much more like what programmers do. You have control flow. You have your make, you've got reusable components, which are these little layers, and they have structure in them. Things that are called like convolution, convolutional networks and whatever. But it's becoming like as a programmer, when you have like an API and you work in that API, I want to do this. I want to convert, uh, you know, a uh, username to, a, to an email address or something like that, or whatever you might be doing. It's just kind of the same thing for, for deep learning um, um, practitioners. You have these libraries of layers that you're using, and you're building the networks out of just using these layers or functions, as we might just call them. <coughs> All right. Now I want to talk about what is one of the the core techniques in uh, deep learning, this idea of automatic differentiation. 
So I said at the beginning of the talk, um, deep learning is about function composition and automatic differentiation. So we've seen how the function composition comes in, and let's talk about automatic differentiation. This is getting the software to compute the gradients for you. So I think the first point and the um, most important point I'll be discussing is that derivatives are compositional in the same way that functions are. Then we'll be looking at ways you can compute gradients, and we'll be focusing in particular on two algorithms, forward mode, automatic differentiation, and fairly briefly, the reverse mode. Okay. So let's look at our composition of derivatives. This is the core idea that really makes this um, deep learning work, in my opinion. So functions compose. Let's start with functions, get familiar. What do we mean by function composition? Well, we've already seen it in building up um, the deep learning models. Function composition is just applying a function to the output of another function. And we can write it if we want fancy mathematical symbols as this kind of circle, or we can think of it as um, you know, g being applied to the output of f. So it's something that we do all the time. Now, the important part about derivatives is they also compose. And this, if you remember from calculus, is called the chain rule. And what this is saying is the derivative of two functions stuck together, composed together, is the derivative of the outer function applied to the output of the inner function multiplied by the derivative of the inner function. And this is really important because it means we can um, calculate derivatives separately and then combine them together. If we couldn't do that, then deep learning wouldn't work because we wouldn't be able to build it up from small pieces. We'd have to treat the whole thing as one giant unit. So composition of derivatives by the chain rule is the, um, the whole thing that makes this work. OK, so derivatives compose, but how do we actually calculate the gradients? Um, now, there are different approaches here. One is what I like to call the mathematician's approach. Probably the thing you learned uh, in school, otherwise known as symbolic differentiation. And basically, you write down your equation. You get a whole ton of rules. Here are a few of them. You probably remember a whole bunch more. And or maybe you don't remember them. I didn't remember them until I l looked them up. And you basically, you look over your equation and you grind through the rules, finding the rules that match and applying them until you get a derivative. What's nice about this is it gives you an exact solution. It's also nice that it'll answer questions on your calculus exam if you did such things. Um, the problem with it is that you can only use what are called analytic equations, things you can write down that mathematicians accept. So no loops. No conditionals, none of the fun programming stuff. You have to have the whole sort of equation written down there. It's not really a compositional technique. The other problem is that the size of the derivative is going to grow exponentially in the size of the equation you started with. And that's because of things like the chain rule. When you see the chain rule, you introduce two derivatives. And the original function is in there as well. Um, so it's getting bigger and bigger. So it's not so great. Now let's look at the, uh, the computer scientist approach. I shouldn't call it the program. I should give it more, more status. The computer scientist approach, of course, be to hack everything up and just do it numerically. So you're saying, well, I've got a function that takes a double. I'm going to take a double and add a little, a little amount to it and see what, what do I get. I take the difference <coughs> and divide by that little amount, and that's going to give me some approximation to the gradient, the sort of numerical approach. The great thing about this is it works with any function, right? You can stick a double in. You can stick a double that's been changed by a small amount. Um, the problem with it is choosing this small amount you're changing that double by is difficult. And the error can vary wildly depending on your choice there. So it's normally like a sweet spot, which already depends on the function. So it depends a lot on the, actually how the numeric computation is being done. And it's not clear. Um, what that value should be until you've done some experimentation. So it's not the best way of doing things. What is the best way of doing things is this technique called automatic differentiation. And it's kind of a combination of the symbolic approach and <coughs> that it uses as a base the symbolic um, derivatives. And it's also got a bit of the numeric approach because it's working out the derivative at a particular point not giving you an equation for the derivative, which the, um, the symbolic approach does. So two main algorithms, forward and reverse, and it gives you an exact solution, and it works with any function. So it's quite nice. 
So let's have a look at the forward mode, which is the uh, simplest way to implement this. The big idea here is we calculate with what are called joule numbers. Um, what's interesting about joule numbers, they're basically defined like this. They are very kind of similar in the idea to complex numbers, though the algebra, rules of algebra are a little bit different. Um, and they're also kind of similar to if you ever did like naive calculus with sort of infinitesimals, they work in a, in a very similar way and they're surprising they actually work. Um, so we're gonna, what we do is we're going to represent a number, a number A with having another little component which sort of tags along with it, which is gonna be this epsilon, B epsilon term, which represents the derivative. And we have this rule whenever you multiply two epsilon terms together, that you get zero. So we can represent that in code like so. V is the value, the point, the actual double, and D is the derivative so far. And then we add in rules for um, our basic operations and our functions. And these are just the same rules that are used in like the symbolic differentiation. So for, for addition, it works just like addition. You add two numbers together, you add the kind of the number bits, the, the real bits, and you add the derivative bits together. And you can implement that like so. Add the values, add the derivatives. Multiplication, it just multiplies out and we apply that rule that when you get epsilon squared, that's zero, so that term goes away. And if you look at the, um, the formula of the product rule in uh, differentiation, it's just this. So um, let me implement that in the code like so. And where we go. And uh, the final bit we need to do is our friend the chain rule, which says when you've got a value and the derivative, then you get the value of the function at that point and the derivative at that point multiplied by the derivative of the previous step. And so here's an implementation of that, say, for, for the sine function. The derivative of that is cos. And you see we have cos of the value multiplied by the previous derivative. That's basically the chain rule wrapped up in there. All right, so if we have a simple function, let's have sine squared, let's just make it a little bit more complex. We can implement that like so, as you can see, it looks very similar. Um, we'll just run it with the dual number, set one to be our derivative, so that we, we basically uh, place to start with the identity. And we get back the dual number saying the value is 0 0.7 and the derivative is 0 0.9. Um, one of the nice things we can do in Scala is we can generalize over functions using doubles and using dual numbers. We can just say, let's define a few type classes for these. So an example in the spy library, you have this jet called jet. I'm not sure why, but it just there's another name for dual number. And then you can define something like this. So a method in this case, because we don't have um, implicit functions yet. And then we have um, a few type classes from SPY defining operations. So trig is the trigonometric operation, the sign, and the field is giving us the, the multiplication. And then because we have implementations in SPY for that for double, those type classes, we can stick in a double, we get back just the normal result, stick in a jet, as they're called, and we get back the result and the derivative, which matches what we computed in the previous example. So a very nice technique you can write in your code if you want to do this. Um, allows you to choose what you're doing. You're doing doubles, you, you don't care about differentiation, you, you want to use dual numbers, you do care about um, differentiation. So for simplicity, all these examples I've shown so far have been using just normal numbers, doubles, reals, whatever, one dimensional. Um, in real cases, for deep learning, you need to generalize this to tensors, to our multidimensional arrays, which is not more complex, just more tedious. So I haven't done that here in these examples, because I wanted to keep the examples relatively clean. But um, it, it all goes through in the same way. Right. One of the things about forward mode is that it scales in the size of the input dimension, so the dimension of what you start with. And in a, uh, a typical deep learning context, say your input is an image, that's quite a high dimensional thing. Like if you know, a megapixel image is a million pixels, and each pixel has probably got three red, green, and blue. You might break up red, green, and blue. 
you've got three, three million dimensions or, or more. So often for, uh, for deep learning, you take another choice, which is reverse mode automatic differentiation. Um, the key insight in reverse mode is that the chain rule doesn't really care which order you compute things. So here's the chain rule again. And with forward mode, we were calculating things from the right hand to the left. We're saying we already know the derivative of f. We've calculated that derivative. We're now going to multiply it by the derivative of g at that the value. But you can go the other direction. You could go uh, derivative of g multiplied by the value of f at the point we're looking at, and then multiply it by the derivative of f. And this is inverting the control flow because you calculate your result going one way, and now you need to go back the other way to um, calculate the derivative. And so to do this, you need to capture the control flow somehow. So the way we do that is we either use continuations or we use monads. And since we love monads, and continuation is not something we often use in um, Scala, let's just talk about monads. The key thing in monads is that the flat map now becomes basically the chain rule. So it looks like this. Um, we have the AD automatic differentiation task. And we have this value. So V is the value just like it was in the forward mode. And K is now this continu continuation, which allows us to go backwards, to compute things backwards. So when we do a flat map, <coughs> we uh, construct this continuation, which is going to go sort of backwards. And then it's applying the chain rule there. And so you construct all of these things. Same old rules that we saw for, for plus multiplication and sign and so on, which I've, I've just implemented sign in terms of flat map to show that we can do this. And then when you, at some point, you ask for the gradient, and it, you have this big chain of functions, which are all calling each other. And you stick a value in the top, and it goes backwards through the control flow versus the control flow computing things. OK. It's a little bit more complicated, um, for sure. Possibly you don't fully understand at this point. That's OK. There are lots of references. The main idea is this reverse, reverse control flow and the fact that this algorithm actually exists. And what do you know? When we run it, we get the same value we did before. So just ask for the gradient, we get the gra exactly the same gradient we did before. The most important thing about reverse mode is that it scales in the size of the output dimension. And normally in your deep learning situation, the output is a lot smaller than the input. The input might be a big image. The output could be like a little a label, a number saying whether it's a person or a dog or a piece of cheese or whatever. So that's why we prefer reverse mode in most um, deep learning frameworks. So forward mode is easier to implement and very natural to work with if you're not concerned about high numbers of dimensions. OK, so that's like the fundamental algorithm that works within deep learning. Now I want to talk a little bit more about um, where I see the deep learning going and what role Scala may play in that. So I said that um, differential programming is automatic differentiation and compositional code. We've seen that. We've seen how composition or derivatives plays an important part. Um, in allowing us to, to do this. We've seen the automatic differentiation algorithms for computing the derivatives, and now they lean on this compositionality. Um, <coughs> now, the, one of the other big ideas of differential programming is we want to treat programming as programming. And what do we care about in programming? Well, some of the things we care about are ergonomics, how usable is our system. Sometimes we care about correctness as well. And we also care about performance. So let's have a little talk, see some of the things that are coming up here. So um, in terms of ergonomics, we saw it was like the forward mode um, differentiation and in the reverse mode, it was very ergonomic. You could basically write this, and that would calculate a derivative if you so cared to do that. So that's a, a you know, very easy system to use. It looks just like normal programming, but you get to compute a derivative when you want. Here is how you would express the similar thing in um, TensorFlow in Python although the bindings for Scala are similar. Um, it's fairly horrendous. I mean, this is a very small function, so you can probably understand what's going on there. But you can see how writing a complicated function in TensorFlow could quickly get unpleasant due to this. And um, there's a solution here. And the solution is you know, just 
better DSLs, and we can do that very easily in, in Scala, for example. We've shown that um, just in the previous slides where we implemented forward and backward differentiation. So I think that's something where uh, we're definitely we are seeing improvement now, and we can see 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 more. Correctness is where I think uh, things get really interesting. And um, so, what are the basic correctness requirements? Well, one is that the dimensions have to agree. When you have a three by five matrix, you can only multiply by a vector of dimension three, and you get out a vector of dimension five. And um, yeah, these invariants hold, got a hold of all throughout your program. The dimensionality of all of your tensors has to match up. And this is not something that's typically enforced by the current deep learning systems. They just have like a tensor type, which can be a tensor of any dimension. So this, this is checked at runtime, which as we know, checking things at runtime is a great way to introduce bugs. So can we do better? Can we represent these types Oops, at compile time? The other point where um, types are really important, and this goes beyond just the, the dimensionality, is that each of these dimensions has some meaning. So it's very common, again, here's a TensorFlow example, to do operations on a sort of by axis basis. So here I'm reducing along axis one. What is axis one? Who knows? You just have to remember, should I actually be reducing across axis two, axis four? So these primitive APIs are just leaving this information up to the programmer to remember. And we know that's a great way to make errors. So what's the solution? The solution, of course, is expressive type systems. So express the dimensionality in the types and, and give names to those dimensions. What does it actually mean? Is one the red channel, one the green channel, one the blue channel? That's meaningful. Then I can, I've got a much better chance of doing the right thing. And we can do this in Scala. We need... Um, type literals, is that what they're called? We need uh, things like HLIST, but it's, all the tools are there. And um, here's a project that someone, someone is working on. It's a project called Nexus, which is doing just this, putting those types in place for a better programming experience. The final thing is performance. Um, we need to compile the GPU for performance reasons. Um, how do we do that? Well, the way we do it now is we have these embedded DSLs. This is why TensorFlow is so awful. It's because you're building up basically its abstract syntax tree directly. So we can then go and walk that, compile it. Um, what are we going to see in the future? We might see uh, languages built for ten, um, doing this type of deep learning stuff directly. The Swift at the moment, right now, is there's a sort of Swift being integrated into TensorFlow where you just write normal Swift code and the compiler understands how to convert that into TensorFlow code. Um, I'm more interested in approaches which don't require sort of rebuilding the, the language completely. And here I think staging is a great thing. And so there's another project here by uh, Tiak Rompf, who actually is a student called Lantern, which is building this into Scala. And the idea of staging is you don't, <laughs> Your program is not one unit which is compiled at, at once. You have a program which generates a program. And so once you have that in place, it's really useful for data science in general because often things like the dimensions we talked about earlier, the dimensionality of your data comes when you load that data off the disk. You don't necessarily know until you start processing it. So you want to have a program that loads the data and says, okay, these are the dimensions, write the program that then uses that dimensions. Or well, the other thing you can do is you can walk over, you can walk over your program and, and generate output, say, for TensorFlow. So I think that's really, really interesting work. So conclusions. Deep learning is about function composition and derivatives. FP is about function composition. Nice, familiar stuff. And we can easily express derivatives in this compositional manner using these two algorithms, forward and backwards. Um, I think Scala has got a good chance of being the next generation of deep learning systems. We're seeing now people are really realizing the shortcomings of existing systems. But to be honest, it's a lot of work and, and nothing happened unless somebody picks it up and I don't think I'm the person to pick it up <laughs> and do it. Anyway, there we go. Thank you for your attention and do you have any questions? <clears throat>